Hello, greetings folks. Um, I will be leading this one today. Um, fellow co-chairs are not on. If you can drop any agenda items into the meeting notes, which I posted in Zoom, they're also in the Slack channel. Welcome, folks. Did anyone else join there? Uh, please add your name and any. Oh, please add your name and any agenda items to the meeting notes, which I posted again. I see that you added one, Jim. Welcome and thank you. How much uh, time do you need for that normally? Yeah, so we can, um, depending on the other items, you know, about 10 minutes should be good for a quick demo. If you want to go deeper, we can certainly showcase more use cases and other items. All right. Are you familiar with the Telcom user group? I had a quick discussion with Victor as we were discussing uh, different use cases and I have looked at some of the documents and other information, but not deeply familiar, but I am at a high level, yes. All right. Typically for longer demos, we suggest putting them on, on that. Um, okay. In the, within that user group, but a 10 minute demo sounds good and, and then for sure discussion that's the main focus here is this your first time in this group it is all right so and have you been have you gone to the cnf working group repo no 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 uh, just i just invited uh, taylor um mm -hmm. because uh, i guess like uh kiberno is a great tool like uh, at least it'd be nice to be aware of uh, the benefits and all the efforts that they are doing there um, so yeah, it's, it's the first time you're here. So um, I guess like he can present that and just share a few few um, things that they have, and eventually maybe we can uh, do a another more deeper demo in the future. But yeah, I guess for now, like what Jim has, like ten minutes showing what is a minimal uh, or the basic ideas. I guess it's good enough. What, what do you think? Yeah, sounds good. Um, maybe um, thinking about the focus, so just a quick overview for you, Jim. Um, the CNF working group, or it's cloud, it means cloud native or stands for cloud native network function. And the focus is on identifying best practices and the use cases around those where for networking applications so that we can see how they can best run in a Kubernetes environment. So we're specifically looking for things that 
might already be obvious and other like enterprise applications and stuff. Okay. But how do they get applied? So this um, run as a non root user, the pod security right. part of your demo, that's relevant to a whole area on the security side that we've been looking at, specifically within the principle of least privileges. And um, one of them would be running your processes as non root. So that's actually what we're going to be talking about today is one of them, one of the things. And um, that's so that's a goal. So if there's use cases that you know of that are would be useful that illustrate here's why you should run as non root, here's why you should do these other security things or whatever, then that would be good contributions into the working group. And okay. also areas that are problematic, like here's an area that is, you know, they're thinking about over in um, the plumber's working group or, you know, SIG testing or wherever. And if you point out they're trying to work on it, but they don't, they're having some problems. Those are also area, those are kind of gaps. And then again, the end goal is to be able to share here are best practices that we're trying to get everyone to adopt for the platform and applications. A, another initiative that's related that I think, I don't know it, um, enough about this project that you're gonna demo to say, but the CNF test suite, um, it's actually focused on creating tests that try to check practices and how they're, how things are deployed and how it's running, how it works in runtime. So this would be, you know, deployment onboarding of new applications as well as like the second, second non-going okay. life cycle management type items. Um, so it, it goes across the board. So it, we, that, initiative actually use um, various tools like Falco, if you're mm -hmm. familiar with that, and yep. um, OPA and other things as part of it, Okay. the testing. So this might be something that could even be used there. Um, we could talk about that. Perfect. Okay. Um, does anyone have anything else to add to the agenda? All right, um, I'm having some problems. I ju this just came up. It's see, this is just going like this. So, uh, Bill, are you available if my screen um, dies or I don't know, Lucina, somebody that could help if if I can't load something. Essentially, right now I'm okay. Um, so the this best practice. So we've been working on a whole set of use cases and we have a bunch of write-ups around this. I'm not gonna go back through, but if, if folks wanna look, you can go and see in the notes, there's links to documents around least privilege and other things. We've had this best practice for a while <clears throat> and we've been going through and resolving um, issues. We're now down to a point where everything has been resolved and we have, uh, some of this is pulled in just because it's it's from the, the main branch. So these are typos and stuff, so we can ignore that. Here's the main best practice. So, this is for the non root. With the recommendation that all the processes should by default be run as a non root user. Part of the defense and depth strategy against compromises. If something gets through, then what do we do? So, this is the idea. So here's the set of user stories. This is one of the last kind of remaining thing, uh, writing these up. So there's a whole set of user stories that can be used around 
at a minimum, the least privileged items, there's probably other security things. Um, so wherever something does break through, if it happens, which is likely at some point, then how can we stop it? Well, the, the non-root user is part of it, but so compromised updates or maybe a central registry, maybe it's coming directly from a vendor, maybe there's some other you know, centralized registry where everybody's pushing to and updates, maybe the registry itself was compromised and um, we actually pull down compromised code. Maybe the images or there's, if, if someone has done more of a lift and shift and the application is not deploying new images for updates, instead it's doing an update within itself which wouldn't be a good practice in of itself, but if it was doing that and it uh, wasn't using root, then it could limit some of those things. And there's several other user stories. I'm not gonna try to pull these up or maybe I'll, I'll see if it loads. No, nah, I don't think it's gonna load. So y'all can click through this if you wanna check them out, but we have a bunch of user stories written out and um, a bunch of references going to different places talking about why this is a good idea, including the CNCS um, tag security white paper and a bunch of papers from different uh, other folks. Um, and I, I think that's about it. We talk about some ways to check for these things that can happen. And it happens that the CNF test suite also can check for this one. So that's it. So Taylor, we, mm -hmm. just, just one thing about that one. It's like, uh, at least I noticed that you haven't revised the latest changes. So um, at least for me, it was a little bit hard to distinguish what was the difference between uh, uh, the, the previous or like, uh, like what is like this PR adding so I don't know if you can, like, because now it's reflecting 70 changes. So, I mean, most of them are coming from other commits. So I don't know if you could just revise it or we just need to focus on the, the, the document that you have created. Because I'm going to try to pull it back up. It's having a hard time, but I'll... Um, yeah. If, if someone else wants to pull it up and share, then you can do that um, and I can walk through it. But the, the, we were actually at a point where everything was resolved and ready to go, except for the, the user stories. So um, everything else that's been updated has been typos, spelling, or somehow I think either in a rebase or a merge, We've pulled stuff in from main. Yeah, it's, I don't know what's happening with my DNS, but um, we've pulled stuff in from main that is um, causing all of those commits to show. But those are on other files like the GitHub Actions files, the spell check file. Um, read the read may got updated for spelling so uh, here we go so here we, so these workflow i don't know why it's showing here pulling over here yeah. so that it should be a no op whenever it goes on to the there sh shouldn't do anything on the main when we merge these in get ignore so ignoring the dictionary, this is probably already on main and the rebase pulled it in spell check. So that also shouldn't matter. This readme, that's a spelling um, update that someone did. Um, this one is also a grammar issue on the existing process doc document. I'm gonna skip this one for a minute. We can go look at some of the others. Uh, again, spelling on the main readme, 
glossary. This one is updated on the main so that this is bringing this branch that has the process aligned with what's in main. It added some new, but we already have these on the main branch. Uh, this is one of the GitHub action things, I think. Um, this is more spelling on an existing use case. Spelling on another use case. This is the newest and one of the older, actually, um, use cases, the onboarding use case. It's just a full add. It's already been added to main. So again, this is something where the PR is messing up because it's not it's not going to actually be an update. It's, it is um, already there. Supply chain attack. So this is new. This is the user stories. Um, it looks like we have some spelling errors. There it is. I see it. I think, uh, Victor, would you mind doing like a, a commit suggestion for those? Sure. Yeah, I can. I can do that right yeah. now where it says container instead of container. <clears throat> um, but this is the uh, user stories. So this is a defense in depth supply chain attacks so talking about what those are. Um, saying you can have, whether it's bugs or an actual malicious actor that's trying to get something in, there's a lot of places from development all the way through production where a problem can happen. Um, you can have a bug that's all the way in production and it wasn't intentional, but it could cause some type of security issue and and then they can get in that way and these are the actual stories about different different ways that this can happen and that's the main thing that one and then this section right here user story adding this section with the user story. The rest of the the rest of the pieces within here were either spelling or specific changes requested by folks in the comments. So if I, I probably can't see it here, but if we if we look at like the conversation, there was some stuff that Ranny um, suggested and those were accepted changes. Um, um, uh, uh, Liko, um, she suggested several things. Those have been accepted. Uh, Pankai made suggestions and those were included. If we show like very minor things on the central system. And actually, this user story got deleted, so it doesn't really matter. But there were several things like that on essentially like this. Uh, notice, here's a question that shouldn't be there. OK, yeah, this was a comment that somehow made it in the code, so we deleted that. But these were the minor changes. Most of, the, most of this was all done all the way back in July, uh, July and August. And then the user stories was what we were waiting on. And those came in. Um, if you go down, you will see my, um, yeah, the comments to change the container typos. All right. I'm going to see if I can load this as, oh, it loaded. All right, and then I can do a,
All right. So I think that's it, Victor. And, and um, you can, I just refresh, you can do a, a new review. And it was pointed out that it's harder to um, review because of the rebase. So, um, not a whole lot that we could have done on this one because it's been open for so long. But maybe we can figure something out next time. Uh, any other comments or before we merge this, we do have enough approvals. Yeah, apparently there are a few words which are not in the dictionary, but I can just add later. All right. All right, I'm gonna squash and merge. Huh, I'm gonna keep that one because it's funny. That's a comment. Uh, what well, should be tested? Uh, that happened. Add a format version. I don't know what that's for. I think this was already covered. It was tagged when rigid. Okay, let's delete that. Let's delete that. Several additional terms. That's not what, but Bill, you want two different co authored? Let's remove that one. No, it's okay. You can just do one. All right, let's get rid of that in the same. Let's fix this. 
Wow. So you can see there's a whole lot. Okay, let's see. Adds pies. Let's forget that. Typos, spelling, fix glossary, upgrade, super winner. It's alignment. It's okay. It's a whole lot going on here. This shit. Okay. Another bill, another vector. Gurge. Wow. Everybody was on this one. These were deleted. Taylor, I, I just wondering if they were uh, taking time. Uh, I don't know if Tim can start presenting. I mean, it, it's- Yeah, no problem. I will, let's do that. Thanks. <clears throat> Jim, go ahead and I'll finish this. All right. Head up. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, let me, um, you know, I'll just kind of do a very quick introduction. In fact, this um, presentation, I'll kind of just share a few slides from, is something I did at OSS Summit just last week, so on Kiverno. Um, so just quick introduction to myself, because this is my first time in the working group. And thank you for having me and being open to kind of listening to Kiverno and what we're building in the project. So I'm one of the you know creators as well as a maintainer on the Kiverno project. I will also act as a co-chair in the Kubernetes policy working group and a track lead in the multi-tenancy working group. So also, of course, participate in other various uh, forums like, you know, tag security, SIG security, et cetera. And I'm a co-founder and the CEO at Nirmata. So just a um, few, few things on Kiverno and I'll jump around. I'm not gonna go through the whole architecture because this was an hour long presentation. There should be a recording up uh, in a few weeks if you're interested, um, you know, I can share that with the team. But uh, talking about why, you know, what's the motivation for Kiverno and, you know, what's the, what's the kind of, um, what are we trying to solve with this project, right? So first off in Kubernetes, of course, policies are becoming critical um, as, you know, the complexity of Kubernetes and not just Kubernetes, but extensions being built on Kubernetes continues to grow, right? So what we're trying to do with Kiverno is to bring a very Kubernetes native uh, way uh, to policy management, right? And obviously, given that our tagline is Kubernetes native policy management, it begs the question, what does that even mean and why does it matter? So one way of kind of, you know, picturing that and thinking of that is uh, there's several tools which, you know, talk about being Kubernetes native, but what we mean by this is being, you know, fairly deeply plugged in into the control plane, being able to not just talk to the Kubernetes API server, but also understand Kubernetes API schema, uh, understand custom resources, and be able to work with Kubernetes patterns, idioms like pod controllers, you know, things like knowing uh, what pod admission control means and how do we complement that and extend that to provide better security and automation tools. So that's kind of what we're trying to solve at, uh, you know, with Kiverno, make it really simple to, and uh, very um, native to Kubernetes in how policies are written, how policies are managed, and even how policy reports um, are visible, you know, in, in Kubernetes itself. And we'll see that in a quick demo that I'll do, right? But just to quickly explain, I'll kind of skip past some of this. Uh, feel free to let me know. Uh, if there's things you, know, you, know, you want, if there's questions, et cetera, we can go back. But just how Kiverno works, uh, it works as a admission control um, uh, time webhook. So it integrates and I'll go through a quick install. It's very simple to bring up on test clusters or production clusters. It supports full HA mode for, you know, uh, if you have larger 
clusters, but it's very simple to get started and install. It uh, plugs in as an admission control, uh, mutating as well as validating webhooks. It start re starts receiving then policies you know, or you know, requ admission requests. And based on your configured set of policies, which are just Kubernetes resources themselves, it will either validate, block, or mutate, as well as it can generate um, you know, new resources on the fly, right? So it brings up quite a lot of interesting use cases. For example, when you deploy a new workload and you want to, you know, let's say, mutate the pod, um, even, you know, for example, I saw some, um, you know, like some other you know, um, things, but it doesn't have to be just for pod security, but you could automatically inject or you know, override a security context. Could be like injecting sidecars, could be even changing things like network settings, et cetera, on the fly or creating completely new resources. For example, if you're running a service mesh and every time a service is created, you wanna generate certs and create uh, an Istio service, right? Those type of things are common use cases we're starting to see in the community. So just to explain how a policy works and there's different kinds of rules in Kiverno. So every policy has a set of rules. Each rule has a match or exclude block. And that lets you do some fine-grained logic on which you know, resources to match, which namespaces, even you can match by user roles, uh, labels, uh, things like that. And then you can, you know, Bay, once you have matched a set of resources, you can run you know, rules to either mutate, uh, to verify uh, and uh, you know, images, image signatures. So I think uh, earlier, Taylor, you mentioned supply chain security. So that's of course, something that uh, requires admission controls to complete that end-to-end -end, uh, security in a uh, posture and um, it's some of the work that's going on uh, with other communities like Sixdoor, we're integrating uh, Cosign with Kiverno to also be able to verify image signatures from any OCI compliant registry. Um, and, and then you can of course validate which uh, can either be just blocking. So if, you, if something's non-compliant, you can block in production clusters, or you can report and audit in dev test clusters. And you can have a mix of this based on policies or even based on namespaces uh, as you wish. And then, like I mentioned, another powerful use case is generating resources itself, right? So this allows you to automate a lot of things which previously required custom admission controllers. We're seeing more and more use cases um, and even simple things like if you want to deploy, you know, a registry secrets, uh, other cert like things like certificates, things like that, you can either generate and, and you know, kind of manage on the fly and make available to every workload, or every namespace. So with that, let me dive into the demo and I'll show, you know, some on the Kiverno uh, IO website. And you know, we have a whole bunch of sample policies. Today, we'll just look at the pod security policies. And, you know, but there's several other best practices, for example, um, using immutable label uh, tags, right? And not, um, not using something like latest. Now, it seems harmless to use latest. And of course, it gets used quite a bit in dev test. Uh, I do that, everyone does that. But uh, if you're running in production, you want to use a version, you know, uh, software. You want to also do things like replacing your image tags with digests. Um, all of these are best practices, and there's uh, 80 plus policies driven by the community, and this list keeps growing with every release. So certainly several to kind of look through. But just focusing on the pod security, I mean, we talked about uh, running as non-root as one of the policies, but there's several other policies and all of these are you know as per the definition of the pod security standards in kubernetes so this if you're not familiar with um, is a very key document which is driving uh, so psps were one implementation of pod security standards but now there's other implementations like kiverno opa gatekeeper uh, as well as the upcoming pod admission controller which will be you know doing label based settings on a namespace level granularity, right? So that will be, I believe it's targeted for version 1.25. But if you're using something like a policy engine like Kiverno, you just get a lot more flexibility in how you're managing these 
profiles and how you're applying them um, across your workloads, namespaces, um, as well as you can do, of course, you know, security, not just for pods, but for other things like making sure um, other best practices like running a read-only root file system is not one of the PSP policies, but that's um, also you know, considered a best practice and a good security standard to apply. So anyways, what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna start by installing Kiverno, right? And I wanna show how easy it is even to get started. So we'll jump back into the documentation. I'll go to the installation. Uh, there's several ways to install Kiverno. I'm just gonna use the you know, command line option through YAMLs. So this will you know, pull down a set of YAMLs uh, and it will run Kiverno. Um, just to kind of you know, show, I just brought up a new mini cluster. And I have, I think, one namespace, you know, that I created. Oops, uh, let's say get namespace. I created a test namespace, which is running an Nginx pod, but that's all I have on this cluster, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is just pull down these YAMLs and install Kiverno. And it will come, comes with a set of, you know, custom resources, which allow you to define policies, which also, uh, and then there's a policy reporting resource uh, which is, by the way, which is also now being used by Falco, uh, by KubeBench, and a few other projects. So more and more projects are generating, you know, policy reports in the same manner, which allows for some standardization and reuse. All right. So if I do get namespace now, we should see Kiverno running. If we do minus n Kiverno, um, and we do a get you know, test, uh, or let's just say get pods. I don't know why I keep saying get test here, but uh, it, so we have a pod which is up and running and it, so Kiverno should be ready at this point, right? So like we can, if we want to make sure we can just check the logs and we'll tail the logs of this, whoops. We can just do it based on the deployment. Get rid of that. Okay, so everything's good. It says it configured its own webhooks, which is what it needs to start receiving policies and things like that. But if I now do, you know, get cluster policy, I don't have any policies installed at, at the moment, right? So it's saying, you know, so if I do, um, so this is our the resource which uh, has, you know, um, which we will now install some of these pod security policies, but at the moment, there's no you know, policies running on this cluster itself. So let's go back to the policy repo. I'll pull you know, here, this is a command which will apply all of the pod security policies and it's gonna apply a customization. So what this customization will do is it's gonna actually set these pod security policies in, instead of audit, which is the default mode that they're configured in, it will set them to enforce. And this means that now if I try to create an insecure pod, uh, that should get blocked by default, right? So to test this, what I'm gonna do, you know, one site that I use for testing some of these insecure pods is there's this site by a company called Bishop Fox They're in the security space. They have the site called Bad Pods which shows you, you know, like uh, pods running with the host namespaces, uh, that run as, you know, root, like several other things are not configured correctly in the pod, right? And you can grab like a deployment or a daemon set or things like that. I'll go with the deployment in this case, we'll go for the raw YAML and I'll grab this one, right? So if we, by the way, if we do that same command again, we should see there's, several policies configured at this point, right? And I'll show what one of these policies looks like in a second once we finish this. But now let's try and run, you know, this pod. So if I do kubectl create minus F, we'll just give it the YAML. And I see a bunch of errors which came up right away, which are saying I can't run on host namespaces. And this is the one that we were interested in to making sure that it's checking 
not just the pod, but uh, like the containers, but also the init containers. Uh, and one thing, if you notice, is when I install this policy, let me actually show what this policy looks like in Kiverno, right? Because um, uh, when I install the, or when you write this policy, the policy itself is written, um, you know, just on the pod resource. But Kiverno automatically knows, again, since it's designed for Kubernetes, it can automatically now apply these policies on deployments, daemon sets, any pod controller which you run, even if it's a custom, like something like a, you know, Argo deployment, which is a custom pod controller, it will recognize and it will apply the policy correctly to it, right? But this is, you know, what the policy looks like. There's just some, you know, again, we're matching on the resource pod. Um, and then we're checking in the security context and we're saying run as non-root. Uh, so if security context, this, uh, this means, this declaration means that um, if security context is configured, run as non-root should be true. And similarly, here we're checking you know, for init containers. Uh, and then we're also doing the checks uh, both in the pod spec as well as the container spec, right? So that's really you know, how, simple it becomes again to configure and run these policies. One other thing I can just quickly show is if we do get policy report minus minus all, um, or let's try minus A, um, I can see that for my existing you know, um, you know, pod, which I was already running, now it's generated you know, some uh, policy report. And if we look at that, you know, um, Let's just do minus O YAML. I'll see all the details of what you know uh, passed and what failed, right? So actually, this is in the namespace test. So I need to do that, and it shows me every workload where you know which and every rule that it applied, which ones passed, which ones failed, and of course, all of this can be collected. There's uh, other open source tools. There's ways to get this into Prometheus. Um, you know, so there's several ways to kind of report this information. In fact, I think I have some slides on that here, which I was showing the default dashboard, uh, as well as there's, you know, a policy reporter project, uh, which can show uh, this information graphically as well, right? So lots of interesting things, but, um, you know, let me pause there, I think, um, and see if there's any questions. Otherwise, we can, you know, keep the demo short uh, for today. and certainly happy to follow up uh, with more details. Uh, I have a question. So very interesting stuff. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, I'm, I'm always supportive of anything that brings us to policy oriented orchestration. I really think that is the future of, uh, we'll keep seeing more and more policies being used in, in lots of areas. You know, I'm thinking of the uh, topology operator for Kubernetes as well, for policies for placement. Um, but my question is uh, maybe uh, if, if you want to talk more about how this would re directly be related to CNFs and where you see it in telco being uh, especially important. Right. Yeah, so one, one quick thought is just making it easy to automate you know, as you're doing testing, as you're doing validation. Um, certainly, this can be also integrated in your CI/CD pipelines. So that's uh, a very simple, you know, uh, simple set of policies, which can be managed through GitOps or any other, you know, solution you wish. Um, the other, you know, thing which uh, so one, by the way, you know, something which may come up is, of course, and we often get asked, how does this compare to OPA Gatekeeper, uh, which do a, perform a similar role, right? So the main difference is how you author policies, but the another powerful use case that Kiverno enables, which OPA Gatekeeper doesn't, is to be able to generate resources. And, and that is also another you know, area where if you want to create policies per workload, you can in fact have policies to generate policies, you can have policies to distribute common you know, elements, to set up different things, which helps, it really helps in decoupling um, you know, that uh, the, the sep creating that separation of concerns, decoupling what the developers have to do from what the operators have to do, which is a fundamental problem right now in Kubernetes and scaling Kubernetes, right? 
In fact, in this, I think I have a slide here where Richard talks about, you know, just uh, policies acting, using those as a contract and helping decouple what developers care about, what security cares about and what operations cares about is where I think Kiverno can help quite a bit. So one area that you could probably help with in this scenario is like, we have policy on networking and similar, and I know you can help in that if, if that networking is through uh, a Kubernetes based um, and Kubernetes aware CNI. But uh, one of the things that we see within the networking uh, and telecom service provider space is that there are secondary networks that may not have the same set of policies or may be unaware of Kubernetes, but end up as secondary interfaces within, within pods. And if you have an, a way to help with where the policies that are there can be rendered into the appropriate SDNs so that uh, the policy can persist regardless as to whether uh, which direction it's uh, that information is coming in, uh, in from or uh, to help with the control of that to say like what systems should be able to connect to each other or not be able to connect right. to each other based upon a set of rules could, could be very valuable. Yeah, in fact, Victor and I were discussing that use case, right? So from my understanding, uh, it seems like what's necessary is based on the cluster configuration, your, your developer or the, the author of the CNF may not know, you know how the cluster is configured to operate. So you probably want to inject some of these settings at admission controls, and it could vary based on where the uh, CNF actually ends up uh, running. Victor, not, not sure if you want to add anything else to that or? No, no, you're very correct. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. One, one use case that we were talking about was um, the usage of NSM, but yeah, for example, Multus and Danon can also uh, include a Few, few modifications or validations in the, the creation. Um, I mean, I like this, this particular project because it's, it's, it's part of the, the, the CNCF. Um, uh, and I guess it's proposing a, a, another cloud native way to, to do the things or more like Kubernetes way. So, and you, you mentioned, I don't know, you mentioned like there are a few uh, default policies that can also take uh, advantage of them. Yes, yeah, so, so this, this policy library, so there are the pod security policies, but there's also like policies you can have for, um, you know, generate, mutate, validate, like we, of course, with every namespace, you know, uh, it's, it's always good to have a default network policy. Uh, but these can be also customized based on the deployment or uh, whatever needs to be done. Like we we're talking about, like injecting uh, a secondary network and you know configuring the pod for that, right? So I think there's a there's a use case. Um, let me uh, see if I can find that. Which it's kind of similar to injecting a sidecar in some ways, right? So uh, it's a fairly elaborate sort of. Uh, in this case, you're. Um, we're, you know, kind of uh, checking for uh, certain things and creating a new container uh, and as well as an init container based on, you know, the policy setting itself. So, but yeah, in terms of defaults, would highly recommend if, uh, you know, and I know the team has already been looking at the uh, running as non-root, but starting with pod security, there's several other controls which are, you know, part of the pod security standards. Uh, so certainly enforcing those because um, there's no typically, um, you know, most pods don't need to run with, with higher privileges. Most, most pods uh, don't, you know, uh, shouldn't be using uh, non-default volume types, shouldn't be using host path, uh, privilege, you know, kind of uh, having, uh, again, requiring uh, escalated privileges host namespaces, all of that can be blocked by default, right? So starting with this set of policies is always a good best practice. Uh, and then auditing for that in your CI CD pipeline, reporting, and, and then of course, enforcing in production. And also Frederick, uh, the use case that you are also mentioning about for example, using Multus, maybe another possibility could be 
adding uh, validation, which ensures that you have predefined that additional network in, in Multus. So if someone is trying to use an existing network, yeah, you can, I'm pretty sure that you can cache all these things because uh, at the end it's just like a single annotation. So I, I'm pretty sure that Kiberno can catch and do some logic to ensure that that network exists. Yeah, and it's it's an issue not only in in uh, Multis, uh, but it, it's like you land an interface, and I could even use network service mesh as an example. You you land an interface here, and uh, both of them have some level of control as to like who's allowed to put the interface there. There's uh, there's a, a a portion there that that could be that could be bound against. Uh, there's a little bit more flexibility in network service mesh in terms of in terms of how the policy can get injected and and enforced, but neither neither one of these uh, ha has the has the component that's already built in that is how do you actually program the SDN itself? Like maybe you have maybe you have certain rules that need to be within the SDN once something is set up, how do you ensure that those rules have been rendered into the into the SDN itself? And so those those particular types of things would be would be useful in both the NSM and, and Multis uh, solutions because then if you could define what those rules look like here, then you can render them into each environment and ensure that they're getting applied consistently across the across the board. Are those rules expressed as a Kubernetes resource or are they through a custom resource or a config map or something like that? Oh, they're, they're, not, ex, they're not expressed at all is, is the point. Okay. Is so being able to, like there, there was uh, some literature, I, I don't know if it ended up in the, uh, in the CNTT um, path where if, if you are adding a secondary interface, you have to make a decision this are you respecting the kubernetes policy contract or are you not and if you are um in, in other words are, are you exposing uh, a, a faster kubernetes compliant path or is it a non-compliant path okay. and we and that distinction was was made necessary because if it's non-compliant then you have to rely on the sdn and additional configuration and yeah you, you want to make it explicit to the person who's configuring it that they have to pay attention to this if it's compliant to Kubernetes, you're just providing a faster path. Like maybe I have a, a web application that needs faster access to a storage system. That storage system is exposed in Kubernetes and that you're basically providing a faster uh, Kubernetes path. Then what you're doing is you're saying the SDN has awareness of the cluster and is able to monitor the policies and is able to render those policies regardless as to where the, uh, uh, Regardless as to whether you're taking the slower path or the or the accelerated path, uh, but th that was a distinction that was added at that particular level. But there's still that issue about it, you st what rules do you want to apply to the to the secondary networks that are non-compliant to Kubernetes policy, and being able to 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 match like I have these particular things that I want to have these type of connections with and being able to then set something up where you could eventually interpret that into the appropriate SDN. Like this, I would not provide this with the full set of that, that full path to get there, but could be that first initial step as to like, here's the first half of the problem where we could even express that. And then how do we render that into the SDN is still an exercise that needs to be done, but we'd be a step closer. Okay. Yeah, so happy to, you know, again, help explore and you know, write out some of these policies. We are fairly active, of course, within the Kiverno community, helping users with different use cases. Like we're also like, for example, here you see policies for cert manager. Uh, there's you know, domain specific and other policies. Uh, Flux, one of the GitOps controllers is also using Kiverno for multi-tenancy. Open EBS is using Kiverno as well for pod security. So several projects are starting to adopt, um, um, but so yeah, if would love to kind of work on uh, CNF specific policies, explore some use cases and help 
kind of advertise what Kiverno can do? All right, thank you. Any other comments, questions, or other topics? I guess we only have two minutes, probably not another topic. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, please reach out. I'd, I'd like to talk to you about how you can, I guess, get more engaged for uh, writing up some of those best practices that you're showing in the baseline, maybe. Um, we could okay. talk about use cases uh, that would be make it relevant to the folks in the networking communication service provider space. And I can talk with you maybe about the test suite. Sounds great. You Thank see you. my email in the in the Google Doc? You yes. Contact me that way. Or on Slack. Will do. Thanks, everyone. See y'all next Bye -bye. week. Thanks.